Uh, my name is Mike Roberts, and I'll be facilitating and chairing this session. Uh, I know you're all cardiologists. I'm a respiratory physician. I may be called up any moment now to go back and fight on the front. So if I disappear, don't take it personally. Um, the team that's facilitating this from the quality improvement aspect are from UCL Partners. We are an academic health science partnership based in uh, down south, north central, east London, Essex, Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire. We're a partnership between 23 NHS trusts, community and acute, nine universities, a lot of commissioning groups uh, and STPs, and, and we work to try to bring people together to make change happen at pace and scale in the NHS and social care. And one of our, our big areas uh, that we uh, work in is in quality improvement in the service. So we've been commissioned to deliver this session with you today, and I'll introduce some of our colleagues in a moment. We have a number of different functions. Uh, we are an academic health science network, an academic health science center, uh, a genomics medicine center, an applied research collaboration, um, and uh, work across a population of about six million people. So if you're down in London and you want to come and visit us, please uh, pay us a call. We're on 170 Tottenham Court Road, so just next to Euston and King's Cross, very close, and we offer free coffee. So. Uh, if you're ever down there, come, come and drop in and say hello, and we'll see if there's something we can do. We actually are starting some collaborations uh, in Leeds at the moment with our research teams. Uh, so, again, very interested in meeting you if you want to come down. Who are we uh, physically today? So there's a number of us who will be facilitating. Mark de Belder uh, is going to introduce himself in a moment because he's going to be the next speaker. Peter Wilkinson, a cardiologist, is going to come and talk uh, later in the morning. The agenda for the day... In the morning, it's basically mainly about trying to help you understand more about what the audit is doing and how it's changing. We're trying to move much more towards uh, participants entering data continuously rather than holding data back for blocks of time and then holding it at once. And at the same time, we as an audit team will be trying to send data back to you pretty much more in real time so that as you put data in, you'll be seeing your results coming back to you straight away and I'll try and explain to you why that's important as the day goes on. In the afternoon, we'll be talking about how you can use those data to make change in your organizations. So we'll be talking about some of the methodological approaches there are to quality improvement and the tools that we can introduce you to that will help you think differently about how you want to make a change in the system so you're much more likely to be successful in making a change rather than, as it often is the case, that we feel rather frustrated that change doesn't happen. And one of the key things that's happened to National Audit, and I'm the clinical lead for the National Asthma and COPD audits, so I've been running those audits for 20-odd years, years now, and not dissimilar from what's going on in, 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 in cardiac audit, is that we have a, um, an, an audit cycle, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And, and what we've done traditionally is we've set the standards, and we've done a lot of measurement, collecting a lot of data, and what has happened is that those data have then formed massive reports, which we send back uh, periodically every one or two or three years and they sit on shelves and people admire them as they collect dust but we haven't done a great deal with them that makes change um, and then every now and again we think oh no it's the audit again and we collect data and we go through that. Um, what we're doing now is moving much much more towards this part of an audit program um, this kind of thing, implementing change and what we're trying to do with audit is, is not collect massive tomes that sit on desks and, and shelves, but collect data in real time that we feed back to you in real time that empowers you to understand what your service is doing and where the improvements might be needed in your service, and if you make changes to your service, to see more or less in real time what impact those changes are having, rather than having to wait for the next annual report to come back to you to see that actually all that effort was useless anyway. Um, or the effort did make a change, but we didn't know at the time, and therefore we didn't spread the change out into a, a larger group of people. What we find often when we talk to clinical staff, particularly about audit, is that they have a frustration with audit, that they have not found it helpful in making change happen. And there are a number of reasons for that, of course, it's very difficult to make a change if you don't know how you're performing in the first place. So collecting data is really, really important. And we're going to spend a bit more time this morning talking about data and how we might use that. 
The second frustration often is, of course, I have no time. I'm so busy doing what's not working very well already that I don't have enough time to think about how I might do things differently and better to free up a bit more time and to give better care to my patients. And, of course, that's a huge illogical train of thought, but it's the one we often get stuck in. Uh, how can I possibly take time out to do things? And I think one of the, the skills that we need to develop is thinking about what we already do in our week, which we might reorientate towards improvement rather than what we're, we're currently doing with that time, or um, argue within our organisation, within our department, within our trust, to have a bit more time set aside and ring-fenced in order to make things better for our patients. And I think there are ways we can do that. In the same ways we now have morbidity and mortality meetings that are pretty much ring-fenced, departmental meetings that are ring-fenced. How can we orientate them more towards looking at solutions to the problems rather than what we often do is get bogged down with the challenges that we face and expect somebody else to deliver the change, somebody else to come up with the solutions? Because at the end of the day, we're the people on the ground who know more about the solutions probably than, than anybody else. Then I think there is an issue around how do we make a change happen? And there's a number of people who, as the more senior we get, think we know how to make change happen. After all, we've been in the business for years. But there is actually a science behind change. And in the same way as when we look for evidence about clinical practice, and we wouldn't, for example, take a new drug, drug off the shelf and just, and just use it because somebody said it was a great drug. We want to know what the evidence is. With improvement and with change, there's an evidence base, a big research evidence base, that tells us how to do it properly. Yet I think for most of us, we try and make change in ignorance of that evidence. We just do what we think is the right thing to do. And then we get very frustrated if we don't see the changes happening that we want to happen. And part of that is about the support too. So a common approach to change is it's the manager's job or it's somebody else's job or it's not my problem but somebody else's. So how do we enlist support to help us make changes in the system? And we'll talk a bit more about that. The bottom line for all of this is it requires leadership. And the leadership has to come from clinicians. It can be supported by manage, it can be supported by audit teams, supported by the data teams, but it has to be clinical leadership. And if there's no clinical leadership, change won't happen. So we have that responsibility to be involved and not to abrogate that responsibility to others. So again, a really, really key learning point from today is how can we find the time, how can we get the support to make that leadership effective rather than be very much disappointed by the fact that we try to make change happen and it doesn't happen in our systems. So just some very straightforward, simple things, and they may seem obvious, sucking eggs, but they are the truth, the reality, that we can make a difference if we think a bit more carefully about how change can happen you will know that there are people in your organization who also want to make change, who feel like you, so you need to link up with those people. You can't make change happen on your own, although there are things you can do personally that will make a difference, but if you want to make widespread change happen, you need to work in a team. So we'll be talking this afternoon about who might be available in your organization to support you in a team. It's important to make a case for change at organizational level, and there are ways of doing that, and we'll talk about how we can enlist help with that too. You may not succeed first time, so don't worry about that. Failure is not a failure. Failure is just about learning and how we move on to something better and different. And when we are successful, it's really important to make sure that people know about that, that we have made change happen in a positive way. And sometimes we feel a little bit shy about shouting about success, but I think it's really important to share that around with people because it encourages others to come into your team and work with you. And finally, and I hope we'll emphasize this as we go through the morning, remember why we're doing this. It is about our patients, the current ones and the future ones, and therefore it's very difficult for us to defend not doing something to improve our service on the basis of we don't have time when it is all about improving care for our patients. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in our minds. I know we kind of have it in our minds, but we really need to have it there.